Congratulations, YouTube. You did it. You wore me down and you sucked me back in. I have too many subscribers here just to walk away entirely, especially with no alternative that truly stacks up and so many copycat channels uploading my shows for me anyway. But we can't forget the THC's account here is on thin ice. And so the YouTube version of the show has to be prefaced with this little PSA, only to say that episodes that contain the kinds of themes that have been regularly banned on YouTube will not appear here. And even with that precaution, there's already enough in the archive to get us removed, so remember that the higher side chats could be banned or put in timeout again at any time. And I won't be able to tell you guys about it. So if you feel like it's been too long since you've heard from me here on this digital, dystopian, draconian, data mining monster of a police state seeking platform, your first step should be to check the HigherSideChats.com for the latest shows. All right. All right. Enjoy. Brace yourself because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechats.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Rock me like a hurricane, Higher Side Chatters. How the hell are you? From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, just trying to navigate the vast and choppy conspiracy. A task not made easy by our highly troubled times, but as they say, this too shall pass. Yet some mysteries do seem damn near eternal. Why is our planet so radically rich with life compared to every other one we can see? Why are we humans so exponentially different from every other living being we know? And as we dive deeper into a digital reality, why does our DNA seem more and more like some sort of pre-constructed, intelligently engineered code? It's these sort of questions that will always be worthy of an exploration, because I fear that the puzzle may never fully be complete. But there is a good case to be made that while we're told human progress has been a one-way trip to the top, we've actually been devolving from a time when ascended masters or alien gods gave us the proverbial golden apple. Examinations of Egyptian culture, Kabbalah, Hermetics, Greek philosophy, and a variety of ancient texts do tend to seem a bit more dense and advanced than a modern materialist mindset or a man-in-the-cloud spiritual model. Many cultures who have held tightly to their traditions do have myths and legends of sky people, cosmic custodians, or leaders depicted in ways that seem more than human. And well, maybe we should listen. Because good luck understanding the end of a movie if you miss the beginning. Well, today we have with us Bruce Fenton, a very savvy human story reconstructor who has been focused on the answers to these questions for quite some time. Along with his wife, Daniela, they have been investigating the deepest mysteries of history and science, tackling those strange holes in the story that are known as anomalies, and trying to make sense of the very high strangeness stuff we tend to like around here. Bruce and Daniela have traveled the world, taking expeditions to wherever the mystery takes them, and they've put out several great books along the way, with titles like The Forgotten Exodus, The End to Africa Theory of Human Evolution, Hybrid Humans, Scientific Evidence of Our 800,000-Year-Old Alien Legacy, and most recently, Exogenesis Hybrid Humans, A Scientific History of Extraterrestrial Genetic Manipulation. Well, I could not be more psyched to get into this, an ancient aliens acolyte, deep history detective, and human story sage, Bruce Fenton, welcome to the higher side. 
Thank you so much, Greg. I really appreciate that intro. It's a really good overview of the whole topic. And I look forward to, yeah, look forward to again down into the data and the weirdness of it all. Yes, man. This is a long time coming. I know we've been talking about doing a show for a while and it's finally come to fruition, but the timing is great because I really loved this new book, Exogenesis. Sometimes I get the catalogs from publishers and I think, well, you know, I've done this sort of show. Maybe I'll pass on this one. But man, you do not just retread the old ancient aliens ground. You fold in so much more. And I know people are going to love it. I guess to get us started, give the people a sort of overview of how you approach these mysteries, because we have those who emphasize physical beings building us as a slave species in some ancient Frankenstein lab. And then you have panspermia folks who think it's more reasonable to suggest some sort of terraforming probes could be responsible for the unpacking of life on Earth. And you seem to fold in both of these things and more. How do you like to break people in? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I tend to take it back to the beginning and just tackle panspermia and the beginnings of life on Earth, just because there's a huge mystery there in which nobody really can absolutely claim to be the winner. You know, there's the conventional theory that we have emerged from geological and chemical processes through abiogenesis, but you can't prove that. There's no way, we haven't been able to replicate it in any experiments. We haven't identified it happening anywhere on the planet, you know, within the last 4.5 billion years since the beginning of life. So it's not a really a strong theory, right, where you can say, oh, yeah, we've got the evidence, we've done the experiments. So if people come to realize that, I think you then can say, well, hang on, if the very foundations of this story are rather rocky, then, of course, then much of that that follows may also be. I'd posit that we are looking at most likely a case of directed panspermia, and that's the intelligently directed seeding of life on Earth. And there's a, a few reasons why I favor that over abiogenesis or over simply a, a natural panspermia event, which would be life arriving on perhaps a comet or in cosmic dust, you know, happening to have bacteria or viruses on, which is the more widely accepted panspermia model, which has been largely proposed by Professor Wickram Singer and colleagues, which essentially is the, the main figure in that discussion, really, is Wickram Singer. I believe that if you look at this more closely, you find that the most compelling argument has to be some sort of intelligence. The reason I say that is because we have now discovered that life begins on this planet around about 4.5 billion years ago. The planet itself forms about 4.6 billion years ago. Now, that's very fast. You know, 100 million years, life appears, flourishes, right? Now, if you consider that in the beginning, this is kind of a barren hellscape, with lava and impacts and just you know, mayhem. So it's quite astonishing that it's that fast. In fact, it was long assumed it had taken around a billion years of random events before life emerged, and we now know that that's wrong. We found fossils that are going back to about 4.2 billion, the assumption there being that it's unlikely we found the oldest fossils, and so they assume that they probably go back to 4.5. And then separately, there's been DNA analysis, a search for what's called LUCA, the last universal common ancestor of all life on this planet. Now, in that research, they also concluded that all of the organisms that we know today go back to an ancestor living 4.5 billion years ago. So there you've got the, the kind of the fossil record and the genetic data merging. Right, so that seems surprisingly fast and incredibly convenient. It just happens to appear the moment the crust is ready for it, right? So that's why I say that I, I fave the idea that it's been deliberately seeded, that you know, the minute the planet is ready, life is seeded here and begins to flourish. Now, I recognize that for the, the very devout religious, they'll say, you know, this is a creation story, you know, God does this, you know, wave of the magic hand or whatever. And then conversely, the abiogenesis people will die heartedly, you know, doggedly stick to their model. And at the moment, you can't really say anyone wins. I just think the logic better supports this model. We can go from, from that into, you know, a ongoing relationship that I see existing with intelligences from beyond this planet. Yes, I'm glad you stopped there because that's exactly what I was going to bring up next. Of course, the first chapter of any good story is interesting, but it is just the first chapter. And sometimes the insinuation is that we are the product of a handful of events that are so old that they have no real connection to our times, except to say that humans spiraled out of them hundreds of thousands of years ago. 
But I find it much more intriguing that we are in some sort of cosmic zoo or alien energy farm, or just that modern alien abductions and craft sightings are very much related to human origins, that there is some involvement from these beings still. And that seems to be something you entertain as well, right? Absolutely. I think that the best visualization for people to use is that of a garden. You know, that you go out and you plant various different trees and shrubs and vegetables in your garden and you tend it. But you don't spend all day, every day, 24-7 out in your garden, right? You know, you leave certain fertilizers, you do certain things, you tend it, you may cross species with each other, you know, produce, you know, particular types of flowers and all the rest of it. We know that we do all this in our gardens. There is that ongoing kind of, you know, let's remove a weed, let's plant another plant. And that's how I look at Earth. I think that what we have here is after this seeding event, that at least one intelligence, I would suggest more than one intelligence, is taking an interest in progression of life on this planet. We see certain events, for example, the Cambrian explosion, which has been highlighted as anomalous, that mesh very well with the idea of sort of temporally spaced intercessions into our story, where we have what Wickram Singer and his colleagues suggest is a moment where new information enters the evolutionary system, most likely through a retrovirus coming from space, infecting life on our planet at that time, bringing new information into the system, and that that's why we have this sudden explosion of new organisms appearing in the fossil record without precursors. And this has long been a point of debate between creationists and the materialists and so on as to what is actually going on in that moment. Well, the one thing we can say for sure is there's new information, you know, evolution producing new life forms requires some kind of new information in the system. Where is that coming from? Wickham Singer's argument is the best, you know, going to be coming from outside, unless there's a miraculous occurrence here, then it must be coming from somewhere, i.e. outside. And a modified or a natural virus is the best way of explaining this. I would suggest here again that unlike his contention that it's perhaps just random arrival of dust carrying you know, viruses, that again, I see this more likely to be deliberate, that we have these moments where modified retroviruses are seeded into the upper atmosphere and that they then rain down, they infect organisms and they cause these sudden jumps in mutation, almost like this punctuated equilibrium model of evolution. And I think we can see a number of these events across time. And they explain a lot of the other anomalies in, in evolution. In fact, if you look at, for example, the evolution of the wing, right? There's this idea that, you know, if you have a random mutation, like, you know, stubs of a wing, but why are those going to persist? They're of no use, right? The wing is useful when it can allow you to glide or fly. If you just have two flaps of skin sticking off the side of you, those are actually an encumbrance, more likely to be grabbed by predators. They're using up energy. They're of no use. So why do these persist until the point where they evolve into an entire wing? Oh, hang on a minute. If they come as leaps, you know, new information in the system causing radical mutations, then you start to see why things like the eye and wings and all sorts of strange things that are not useful in an intermediary stage might just suddenly appear, right? That we have these radical leaps in evolution. And these are all throughout the entire timeline. I'd only suggest Cambrian explosion because it's a very obvious one. We just have you know, an unbelievable number of changes at once. Yeah, man. It seems like we are kind of predisposed to divide ourselves into camps. And directed panspermia seems like the perfect story to come to when you reverse engineer those science versus religion camps for a common ideological ancestor, so to speak. It's mm -hmm. pretty perfect. And I really do like that idea in terms of things going on today or clues today that could back up this potential epic story. Let me give people a quote from the book here where you write, Daniela and I are among those people impacted by alien abduction experiences. My first relevant experience occurred in the form of recurrent vivid nightmares. As a very young child, I would find myself dreaming that I was on a metal table surrounded by strange humanoid entities. One of them reminded me of the Star Wars character Chewbacca and another of the vampire Count Dracula. But my own alien abduction type experiences pale in comparison to those of Daniela's. To be perfectly honest, all the accounts I have read fall short of the intense things Daniela has been through. Well, you know I gotta ask you to elaborate on that. What could you tell us about her experiences that surpass the typical stories an audience like this is probably well familiar with? 
and how could they relate to this bigger topic of alien involvement in the human story? Sure, yeah, I'll quickly um, sidetrack into that for you. Daniel is a person who's had experiences really from toddler years onwards. Some of her early memories are of being in her crib, seeing entities in the room, including what looked like a kind of, which was an ape-like entity that would jump around, manically jump around the room. Essentially, you know, scare. I don't know if it's just scaring for the sake of scaring, or but would, and she had the sense of that, you know, did it want to maybe grab her? And was it was kind of a frightening figure. She'd also had experiences of flying out of her cot. So, I mean, this was some kind of astral travel type, you know, out of body experiences that she had from around, you know, one or two years old. You know, she remembers that started very early in her life. She's also always had the ability to see spirits of deceased people as well as entities that are not people you know that for her childhood she recalls seeing things like a tall shadow man that would be sometimes in the room an entity that looked a bit like a sort of a tall gray if you want to gray aliens so a bit like that and again alongside this would have experiences of seeing deceased people so that really was from her early years onwards now that i suppose in itself is not completely you know it's certainly not completely unique i mean it's rare perhaps that someone has that intense level of experiences ongoing from so early in life but clearly obviously there are people who are psychic throughout life her experience has become particularly more bizarre i suppose in the last decade when we had well a series of events particularly for her i mean it began really with me when i went to egypt back in november 2011 whilst there i went to a site called abu Ghraib which is, I didn't know at the time, but there's some articles out there you'll find where they talk about the Stargate at Abu Ghraib, I think particularly one by William Henry, the mythologist, that this site is, is rumoured to be amongst the most ancient on the Giza Plateau, and it correlates with the Pleiades on the ground. If you look at this, there's a star map that correlates with sites at Giza. If you mesh them up, you find that this area meshes with the Pleiades. Now, whilst I was there, I had this sense of, connection with the Pleiades. I was sort of looking up, I could see it rising over this site. I had a strong feeling that there was, you know, somebody there. You know, it's very weird, it's very abstract. I'm not what you think of as a you know, classic New Ager who talk about Pleiadians and Arturians, you know, be familiar with that kind of thing. I just found myself saying, you know, why aren't you coming back to help? You know, why have you left the earth like this, all these problems? And you know, it was really abstract, but having this sort of conversation in your head with just some stars rising over this temple. No particular, not like seeing a spaceship or anything. But then afterwards, you know, nothing immediately happened. I'd love to say that, you know, spaceships flew out of the air and, you know, lots of things happened. But no, it wasn't like that. It was just, you know, it happened like that. But then probably about two months after that, I've just gone back to the UK. From the UK, I went to Spain where Daniela was. I, got, I was working in a school with her there. And that's sort of first time physically we met each other. We'd known each other previous to that online. And then from there, we ended up going to Ecuador where she has family and so it was a, a longer story but it's a bit more boring so <laughs> but we ended up in ecuador and so it was within a few days of being there that she had this experience where she became quite sort of ill she felt quite unwell she went to bed so she started feeling a lot of pain and then kind of passed out from the pain and then she from her what she's told me obviously i think experiences she found herself being kind of pulled out of her body taken apart so the sensation was of being almost taken down to your atoms, being you know, torn apart to almost to nothing, and then passing through some kind of energetic barrier, almost like flying through the wall. And then on the other side of this barrier, re-manifesting as herself, but being in this strange space, which she had the sensation of it being kind of dome-shaped, but you could see through the walls, a kind of teal color that you could see through, and see kind of stars through these walls, and that within this structure, there were beings, you know, tall humanoid beings that were in a kind of conference. And they were talking about kinds of events on Earth, things that they said were going to come, things that were happening. Some of them quite crazy, kind of cataclysmic, other things just spiritual. And different groups having different conversations. Some of them would be looking at her, you know, and others were just in their own conversations. Eventually, some of them engaged and they were telling her, you know, there's these things that happen. And, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> and, all, and all this. And a, a really kind of strange scenario. With her, all the time, bear in mind, she was wondering at this point, am I dead? You know, which, mm -hmm. I mean, I think is quite a reasonable thing to think if you feel like you've been dismantled 
through a, some kind of barrier, you know, the logic in your mind is, you know, am I dead? You know, where am I? And at the end of this experience, you know, she was sent back, found herself back in her body. You know, I then asked her, had anything strange happened to her? Because unknown to her, the whole time that this was going on, she was actually mumbling, though unconscious, she was mumbling about stuff. And I could hear her talking about free sons and coming changes and you know, all sorts of stuff that I could hear one side of what was obviously a conversation. And so I was then tried to just test with her, did she remember something odd happening? You know, I don't like to lead people. I wanted to see what she could remember. And so she told me about this experience. Now, after that, every few days, a similar thing would happen. She'd be taken from her body, but instead of going to this meeting, which we now suspect was probably in some kind of flying saucer, because it's in this dome shape, I mean, kind of funnily enough, you know, reminds you that you think, oh, a lot of these objects seem to be dome shaped. May not have been, but that's what we assume now. That afterwards, she would instead be taken from her body and find herself in someone else's body, in this tall lady, abnormally tall, about two meters or so tall. And the first experience, she found herself in a tunnel system somewhere. And she went through these tunnels and found a group of other beings that were the tall humans, abnormally tall humans, having a meeting. And they're all in these kind of Native American kind of clothes. I mean, we now know that they were actually sort of Mayan clothes. And over a number of these journeys, I mean, again, it was dozens and dozens of these journeys, that she came to understand that she was in Palenque, which is down in the Yucatan, and that the, it was around about, sort of around 650 to 700 AD, that kind of time space, with Lord Pacao being the Lord of Palenque, and that there was this whole load of these beings who, you know, she'd given to understand were kind of hybrids, human hybrids that had been modified by an extraterrestrial group, and that there were others there that she saw tall greys that were also in areas under this city. And meanwhile, you've got the normal Mayans, these humans living there in the city. But these lords of Palenque, she said, anything but normal, with incredible powers and run really fast, they were incredibly strong, you know, all sorts of abnormal traits. Now, things she's like, what do you make of that? So she was like, well, there's no way to sort of explain it because you can't really say, we don't know for sure whether it was aliens taking her to the past or whether it's some sort of projection of that time into her mind by some intelligence or you know astral time travel what names gives us but i personally i don't know of anyone anywhere ever that's had that kind of experience yeah. where you've had people mind we're talking about dozens and dozens of these a whole second life that she was living throughout the year 2012 into early 2013 where literally she'd come back sometimes with black eyes from being punched in the face there, who have real black eyes. And another time she was given a liquid, which she believes these greys were trying to wipe her memory. They gave her this liquid, and she was starting to be ill, but then she was vomiting in the bedroom, right? vomiting off the side of the bed. So bear in mind, you know, you're given something in this hyperreal VR place, whatever it is, but you're literally sick here when you come back, like really ill, vomiting and stuff, right? So there was a very permeable line between these two lives and also she would see another version of me there that i was essentially the war chief of palenque and second to pacal and that there i'm kind of i'm still her partner there but i'm this sort of <laughs> kind of slightly obnoxious in a way kind of macho kind of annoying kind of guy for her to actually be <laughs> because you know i guess i've suited the times that you know that i was living in must be you know i'm supposed to be the kind of tough guy you know so it was a really surreal though because she's seeing me there and then she's seeing me in her life back in the present she's got kids there she's got kids here she said you know you, you imagine that she obviously this had permanent life-changing effects on her psychological changes also she feels physical changes um emotional changes because you know you can't live two separate lives without that having major impact and they gave all sorts of information as well you know about changes and showing their calendars of when things would happen and where crystal skulls were hidden in there rooms full of tablets with loads of information on you know all sorts of stuff that was a whole you know yeah it's so strange and i'd hear her at night mumbling in mayan i would hear her talking in mayan right and kicking the wall and stuff and this went on for months so when i talk about that daniela's experiences are extraordinary i mean they're really really extraordinary to the point where I just don't know of any other experiences that are as extraordinary as that. Wow. Yes, yes. And uh, the kind of artifact stuff you mentioned there towards the end is definitely the next thing I wanted to talk about. But mm -hmm. the 
Ecuadorian trigger is kind of interesting because I've heard other stories of paranormal experiences being triggered by a return to someone's ancestral land. You said she had family there. Yeah. We do talk about the veil today being thicker than it was at a time in the past, that communion is more rare than maybe it used to be. Well, we also do have more people away from their ancestral lands than any other time. And indigenous tribes who have stayed in one spot do also seem to have the strongest connection to that spirit world still. Maybe the correlation is important. I, I mm -hmm. don't know. And it seems like it'd be a weird one. But there is a shape there that I've heard before. Well, I do think there's a connection. And what we found out later as well, that her father had had some quite strange experience. And I don't know it was as strange as that. but he told us that he remembered when he was younger that he used to have these very vivid dreams where he was this Inca, some kind of lord in the Inca, right? And which obviously, you know, they stretch their empire stretch mostly across Peru, but at one point into Ecuador a bit as well. And that he would have people bowing to him, you know, bowing to him and stuff. You know, he wasn't he was away, he wasn't like the Inca, the, the emperor or anything like that. But he was some senior person who was connected to where the treasures were kept, you know, some kind of treasurer or something like that. And in these repeating dreams, you know, that he would you know, go around the city and he'd know where things were. And it really echoed with it. And he said, and one day he was with his family and they were driving him along through a town. He was quite young. And he's saying, he looked out the window and he realized it was the town from the dreams. And he was like, I wonder if I know where the gold is, you know, in this town. He said, but then he never then found out where that was. He couldn't, you know, he didn't know what town it was. He was just you know, driving for a town. And the sort of thing about it. He said he never again found that town. But he said he remembers it at one point. He drove for a town. He was like, oh, my God, this is the town that's in my dream. You know, and he was sort of aware that maybe he still could find where that gold had been kept because he was sort of in charge. So obviously I was kind of like, can't you please try harder to remember <laughs> the town? Because, you know. So I do think it's in the family. And Daniela's grandmother was a healer. She was kind of a traditional healer. His father also has had experience with UFOs. You know, these eventually came out. He's not a very, you know, he's someone who's quite closed about these topics. But in some conversations, he's kind of admitted to me that he's had experiences in the jungle there where orbs following him. He'd be in his car and orbs would follow him. He's seen a flying saucer hovering over the cathedral in the middle of his hometown. Also, with what I've said, strange dreams. So clearly there is something in that line, the Ecuadorian line in her family that, you know, is to do with ancestral healing and shamanism. And I mean, she was recognized as being a shaman by the people in Ecuador. I mean, one of the Shua shamanic asked if she would come, wanted to come work with them in the jungle, you know, but, I mean, it didn't really fit with our life. But they were aware from the experiences she was having that she was obviously a gifted shamanic healer. And she's, in my view, a very powerful shamanic healer. I've seen her remove energy problems from people and they're you know they're thrown up you know she does a clearing on people and people go to the toilet and they're puking and stuff and clearing out so i mean it's quite powerful i mean it's again if you're people familiar with those kind of things i get that for a lot of people it's just you know it sounds like we were it sounds crazy but i mean i've seen enough of it myself i'm aware of her experiences i'm aware of what she can do she's helped me a lot personally with my own troubles that i've had with negative energies and all sorts of stuff so, yeah, I mean, it fits with it, you know, and obviously for the people in Ecuador, this isn't a problem. You can sit down and we'd have to, we'd, you know, we talk with sorcerers and healers and shamans. And, we, you know, we met quite a lot of people like that. And she's learned from quite a lot of people. like that. So for them, it's not a strange conversation. And for a lot of people in Ecuador, generally, you can talk about paranormal and metaphysical things without it being seen as crazy or UFOs being seen as particularly strange. You know, these are fairly widely accepted topics. Yeah, and it's quite normal to have a shaman having an office in the town where you can go to see the shaman and stuff, you know, so it's quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love it. And to get into artifacts or treasures, you also write about the long history of psychic communication, alien abduction, information download, and this sort of thing. And note that the messages are often similar, as if there is some sort of higher intelligence or multi-dimensional beings calling up the Earth to check and see if we're ready for wider contact. But even more interesting is this idea that we have physical objects that have aspects of this deep history or these messages embedded within them. Obviously, you mentioned crystal skulls earlier. That's mm -hmm. an example people might be familiar with. But maybe there's even some sentient, projected consciousness inside of them to give people an example of such an object can you tell us about this story from a tibetan zogchen master norbu i guess this is his uncle's story but it's a 
story I hadn't heard before. What's the deal there? Yeah, it's, I think that's an awesome story because apart from anything else, it's really just, you know, it's in a book about Buddhism and, you know, some experiences of this master and who knows. It really it has nothing to do with what we think of, you know, aliens or UFOs or, or kind of that kind of stuff. So he's, you know, he's not telling us a preface by saying he's not telling this story in a way that would aggrandize him or it's important to his life narrative, right? Or to Buddhism. He just kind of uses the example of just one of the strange things that happened whilst he was becoming a meditation master in Tibet. So it turns out, yeah, that his uncle has this dream. They're both, you know, meditation masters, but obviously his uncle is more senior and has had, he's kind of revered as a great teacher. Now, his uncle has this kind of dream and it becomes aware of where there's a sacred object. Now, there's a tradition in the Himalayas that these meditation masters will often have visions or dreams or encounters that give them information where they can find hidden texts. And this is very well understood that sometimes a meditation master will hide a scroll. You know, okay, that's not useful to people now, but that teaching will be great in 600 years' time. So I'll put it there. And the way they, they work somehow will set up a situation that that will be found in 600 years, right? Through consciousness and <laughs> strange stuff that most people have to fathom. But essentially, that there will be, you know, an event like, you know, dream vision. And then the master will think, oh, now I've seen where I can find one of these scrolls or one of these objects. And so this happens, and this guy sort of goes to his nephew and says, you know, what do you think we should do? Should I just go there and we check it out? We see if it's there, you know, see what it is. Or should we go with a few people? And then if it's there and there's something interesting, they can all see it kind of being found. And so, you know, the nephew kind of says, well, if we go and take everyone and, you know, we reveal this object, it will kind of give everyone a greater faith and commitment within the Buddhist practice. So they can see, you know, you've brought this great object out. And so he, he says, I understand, that's a good idea. So he takes a whole load of villagers and off they go and they head off to this area up in the mountains. And when he gets to the spot, he asks for one of these little sort of small pickaxe, like a hand pickaxe, takes it and he throws it up at what looks like just a normal cliff face. And this thing just sticks in. And so he goes, oh, that's where it is. They put up a ladder, someone goes up and it breaks through. It turns like what looks like a wall just crumbles away. He says, well, don't touch the object itself. So they use like a cloth, which they goes in, covers this object, brings it down. And when they open it up, there's this perfect sphere, this luminous white orb sphere just lying on the blanket. He says, no, you know, not to touch this, be really careful with it. And then they take this, and obviously everyone sees it, so it obviously strengthens their belief that his knowledge and his abilities. And they take it, and they take it back to his home. He says he doesn't think that it's ready to reveal its secrets just yet, so they lock it away in a cabinet, and then they put his wax seals on it and everything and puts it away. And then sometime later, he goes back to check on it, and when they open it, this thing is gone. And he says it has been taken away by the divas. And these are divas are essentially you know, entities, spiritual entities. So we have this idea of these tradition of artifacts that are hidden on this planet that seem to be some kind of unknown, bizarre technologies. I mean, we assume it's some sort of technology that is just you know hidden from some past time, and that these occasionally you know, these turn up. You know, and this one, you know, particularly like that story, yeah, because it has no. You know, it's not like a UFO like saying, you know, claiming some UFO. It's just, you know, he's a meditation master and a Buddhist teacher. It just happens to be sort of mentioned in his book. And this, and it kind of stood out to me. Now, I will add as well that, that the same teacher who kind of tells this story, he also mentions one. I, guess, I think this is quite an important one as well, where he says there was a night where he was in his lucid dreams. And he says basically he had lucid dreams every night. He says when you get to a certain level of meditation practice, you can stay conscious, you know, aware throughout your sleep. So every night is a kind of lucid dream. Now, it says during his night, the divas come to him. One of these divas gives him a little scroll and says, you know, this is like for your uncle. And he sort of puts the scroll in his hand and he sort of holds it and he clamps his other hand over it. And he said in the morning when he wakes up properly, he sees his hands are still clasped. And he opens his hands and there's the scroll in his hand, right? So he's astonished. So even though this is someone who has, you know, strange things happen, he's astonished. So he goes, takes his scroll, goes up to the cave where his uncle is. And kind of shouts for him. He says, normally you wouldn't do that. He says, you shouldn't interrupt these masters when they're meditating in the morning, but he says, he's too excited. So his uncle comes to the door and he's like, you know, so what is it? He says, you know, uncle, uncle, look, you know, I've had this dream, the divas came, they said there was a scroll for you and, you know, it's here. And he gives it to him, he says, ah, I was expecting that. He just walks away. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, I thought, geez, you know, it was so normal to him. Whereas you imagine how mind-bending that is for the average Western materialist. <laughs> 
the idea that, you know, for someone else, it's totally normal to get a scroll given by a diva in a dream and have it manifest into your waking day and just go off to read it, right? Like you get in the newspaper in the morning. Yeah, it would be amazing to have that analyzed. Is it made from the same stuff mm -hmm. as our world? Is it what language is it written in? All that kind of stuff. It'd be awesome to dig into that. Absolutely. I do like that. I'm, I'm sure that there's a thousand stories like that from the Himalayas, but, you know, I mean, I, certainly there are stories of, I've heard of plants that have come back from Shambhala and that they say Shambhala is not quite within our vibration. You know, it's not necessarily really here. And so people have brought back things from Shambhala. And there's a guy that mentions having some like a flower on the mantelpiece, which says, you know, his father brought back from Shambhala. And things like. So within that area, you know, there seems to be an acceptance that you can bring back objects from the other dimensions and other planes of existence <laughs> hell yeah man and i guess what happens in the himalayas stays in the himalayas <laughs> yeah, they don't way more so than vegas yeah we don't get those artifacts brought to us to analyze unfortunately so yeah and that story or the first part of it you know with the orb that came out of the cliffside that rhymes with a lot of other stories too i remember diana posolka's book american cosmic where she is briefed on some of this stuff by the silicon valley elite or a modern invisible college who have been brought in to wrestle with these very same things in the corporate world mm -hmm. and one of the anonymous sources mentions that not far from his desk there's some artifact that they keep behind this massive vault door but he can still feel it reach out or reading his mind or trying to communicate something some sort of faint telepathic thing going on. And I'm sure, as you say, there's many of these artifacts potentially squirreled away in deep state basements that we'll mm -hmm. never, ever hear about. But it's awesome when we do. Absolutely. That's where we get a bit lucky with the core of exogenesis, which is, of course, tackling an encounter with one of these artifacts, Chiringa. Now, if you're happy for me, I can go into that a little bit. Absolutely. It's uh, the next thing on my list. So dive right in. And I would say here, I just very quickly say that I think that the crystal skulls and some of these other artifacts are very much the same or very similar, especially if you consider this, the crystal skulls are silica. And in fact, when Hewlett Packard examined, I think it was the Mitchell Hedges skull, that they said it was, in fact, you know, exactly the kind of, you know, perfect quality crystal that could be utilized for storing information and that in theory, it could be holding all kinds of information, but we just don't know how to access it. Right. And I think that's a really crucial understanding before I even go into the next bit, just that, you know, that you've got leading edge thinkers kind of saying, you know, yes, these things could be technologies that we don't understand that have information in them. Right. There is a precedent there. There is. Yeah. And so with the Chiringas, we have this whole law, mythology, history, you know, depends on where you're coming at it from, that these artifacts. Now, a Chiringa is essentially a tablet like object, you know, sort of oval or tablet shaped um, flat objects that appear to be sort of stone like, but again, I would suggest silica objects. And that these have a mythology that they go back to the Alcharinga time. And the Alcharinga time is what some of might refer to as the dream time, the beginning time, it's the creation time, where a lot of the, the first animals and sort of humans and stuff were created, parts of the landscape were created. So you have these stories of these Alcharinga beings who are walking the landscape they're involved in the creation. Now, some of these beings, apparently, they transform into Chiringas. So they take a form that will persist against the weathering of time. So they become these objects. These are living beings now as Chiringa stones. And that they, in some sense, carry information and knowledge. They are highly sacred. They're kept away from the general population. They're only interacted with by the clever fellas, which are essentially a kind of shamans. These are the highest initiate shamans in these particularly much the Arente people around Uluru and the Arente language group. Now, I don't know how many of these are meant to be, but they said the original, there are original ones that go all the way back to the Alcharinga time, and there are others that are copies, but they still consider those copies to be sacred, almost in the way that the energy of it, the consciousness of it can, you know, move into others or you know, include them within its influence, so that those are also sacred, and they're not as ancient. Now, there was a situation where one of these objects was found in a cave going back, I think it was around about a century ago, I don't know the exact date, but one of these objects was found in a cave by someone who was involved in the, the camel trader kind of routes, where it used to be that you know camels were used to move things across the deserts, and the Afghan traders in Australia were using them to you know take goods around. And someone found one of these strings, a glowing tablet-like object in a cave, again, this glowing thing like we had with the other story. 
and that this object was taken and it was kept within a family. Now, at some point, it comes into the hands of a person who wants to go back to the traditional keepers. They're trying to get it back to kind of Uluru. Now, this lady who holds it, she becomes very ill. She has some things going on in life. She wants someone to temporarily look after it. And she ends up connecting with someone called Valerie Barrow, who basically is kind of a holistic healer, regression therapist, you know, a bit alternative. So the sort of person that if you would say to, you know, could you look after my strange artifact, they wouldn't immediately think like, oh, this is crazy, you know, an open-minded kind of person. And she happens to have a house called Altaringa, right? And so this is taken as a kind of a sign that, oh, this is the kind of person I can approach. And so they have a conversation and Valerie agrees that, you know, I'll temporarily look after it. And that comes to her wrapped in paper bark and she's told, you know, please don't open it. The traditional law is that you shouldn't look on these things, touch them on him directly. And so she puts it away in a box in a spare room and says, you know, I'll give it back to you once you're out of hospital, you're better. Thinks it's all going to be normal. And then soon afterwards, she starts having this direct voice to skull communication. With this thing saying, I am Al Turinga. I'm a living being, a star person that was here in the creation time. And start telling this whole narrative of a ship that has grown in a crystalline matrix that is inhabited by a self-aware AI consciousness that arrives here through what sounds like to me some kind of stargate through a portal from the Pleiades, carrying 50,000 beings on board. And there's this whole long narrative. I don't know if you want me to continue it or you can you <laughs> check any of that because I, I, I go on. So. Well, it's definitely really interesting as another example of these things. And it's all throughout the book. You are backing up with modern data and, and information and studies the messages that came from this stone. And yeah. again, with that whole idea of don't touch it, you know, that's something that came up in the earlier story. It also comes up in a story like the Ark of the Covenant. Absolutely. It's like dangerous to humanity, apparently. Mm -hmm. And what I found interesting is you write about what is it that wakes these artifacts up? And it could possibly be the touching of them. Or you even say in this quote, it seems quite logical to suspect that the Alcaringa was the personality for an AI technology functioning as a monitoring and recording sentinel until the appropriate moment for open contact had been reached by our species. It might even be that it encountered some specific electromagnetic frequency associated with our technological development. And I really liked that. Obviously, I copied it down because we have our own electromagnetic fields. So maybe we touch it and it wakes it up. Or maybe it notices that our environment is changing because we do have mm -hmm. a secular environment and that could potentially be picked up by one of these devices. Yep. But they're just fascinating topics of discussion. It's sad that one of these can't just penetrate the main stage of our world. The crystal skulls, I guess, got close. Mm -hmm. But why can't one of these things just penetrate the culture to become this household item that everybody is knowledgeable about because if the story shakes out and as you mm -hmm. present in the book it tends to shake out yeah. i guess it's just hard for people to fathom yeah i think it's not really even an evidence problem or a reasonable problem or logic problem it's a problem about what we are able to accept or process as kind of crazed apes on a joyride through a technological madness or whatever it is that we're doing but I don't think it's anything to do with the evidence or the logic behind this, because we have leading edge thinkers who say, hey, we think that advanced aliens will have Bracewell probes, which is a class of probe that's sent out with these AI on board, which probably have like von Neumann self-repair and you know, all these functions, and that these would be sent out and would land on asteroids and on planets and monitor for radio waves and monitor for signs of life, and that these things would act like sentinels. You know, and that, you know, so this is not something I've come up with. These are leading edge fingers saying that this is exactly what we think they would have. In fact, in the last year, I've seen a couple of different articles come out saying, you know, are there these probes sitting on asteroids, you know, in our local area? In fact, there was one asteroid that was caught briefly, I think, in an orbit around Earth. They were checking that for signs of technologies. So, I mean, we're actually looking for these things, right? In theory, we're supposed to be open to these things. That's what science at least pretends. Yet, if you say that, hey, you know, it sounds like the indigenous people in Australia have encountered one and it actually has activated and it shared information. Look at the look on those people's faces. Like those same people who would write those articles and would say, we're looking for these and we expect them to be out there. Tell them that you found one. Watch the way their face changes. Right? <laughs> right, right. That makes a lot of sense.
So we have a problem there with people, not with the kind of technologies that we're describing, not with the behavior of it, not with the information it shared. We have a people problem. <laughs> yeah, don't I know it? And so you've taken the insight from this stone's messages and also found a lot of other evidence in the history, in the terrain of the earth, and in DNA itself that kind of validates the story. And obviously, we're talking about several different things, yeah. panspermia way at the beginning. But there is another major chapter where the big date is around 700,000 or 780,000 years ago, 780,000 years ago. And you found some genetic evidence that there was a step change in human evolution that coincides with that time. But what's even more interesting to me is the prospect of, and I quote, material evidence proving that a vast crystalline spaceship exploded in orbit above Australia around this time. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you got to break us in on this, man. Pretty amazing. Sure. Sure. And it should work out anyone. And obviously, again, we'll go through the evidence of this, but what I was, I'll preface it again with saying there will be a people problem with this yes. and not an evidential problem because it just sounds so big and for some people so ridiculous, the idea that, you know, this could be, and not only could have happened, that we could find evidence of it because people like their aliens far, far away. We're using radio waves where you can never, you know, get any direct evidence of them. They're comfortable with that. Now, this is an uncomfortable story because it's bringing it all the way to Earth and with physical evidence, yes. okay? So we are told that there is this crystalline structure. You know, that's what the information tells us. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, it's, it's described in some detail. You know, we've got this vast crystalline craft that is destroyed. It's hit with energy weapons. It says, it, you know, it basically is melted and explodes. And finally, the last stage is explosion, like a nuclear explosion. But this is reduced to a liquid, it's basically like liquid glass. It's melted. And it says some of this debris, this molten debris, showers down across the earth. Right, because it's in orbit, and it, so it's destroyed, it showers down across the earth. And I'm thinking, okay, I mean, could something like that remain? And I think initially, Valerie had the sense that this was somewhere towards 900,000 years ago, you know, so really ancient events. And I'm sort of thinking, well, okay, let's have a look, you know, could there be something in the geological record like that? You know, obviously metals we'd expect to rust away or decompose, normally they would, but silica and glasses and stuff can persist a long time. So I had a look through and I'm thinking, you know, I probably won't find anything. You know, I'm not very hopeful, even though I believe this story, you know, for my own reasons, I think it's true, but I don't expect to find this. Turns out that there is a century long mystery in science, the Australite tech type mystery, you know, you have papers with that title on them, where you've had basically a century of different camps trying to explain this material. It's Australite tech type, which is, um, I swear, a tech type is a kind of a glass, a mineral glass that's been produced from high energy events of some sort. And this, unlike any other field of this material, the Australite tectite strewn field, as it's called, stretches all the way from Antarctica up to southern China. In fact, there's Australite found on somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of the Earth's surface. Now, you know, people should take that into their brain and think of that as staggering, for a start, a staggering distribution of material, right? Now, we don't see that from any normal impacts Right. You know, so we've had asteroid impacts all over the planet. We've had those since the beginning up till now. We don't see that. So although on one camp, the scientists have said, we think this is some kind of major impact and it's thrown this material up and it's managed to go all the way from Southeast Asia and then down to Antarctica, which is just extraordinary. If you think of how far that you're talking about throwing material from an impact. Right. And then there's another camp that was arguing that, no, this maybe was lunar material, that something hit the moon. Bits broke off and that, you know, showers debris reached the earth and then rained down that way. And this was this debate that had been raging, right, for decades before I stumbled on this. And both of them, the reason why this argument could continue, of course, is that neither camp could explain all of the evidence and all of the anomalies, but each one had some strengths over the other, right? So this is why it just it persisted. And then what had happened in the last few years was that the lunar theory had been really weakened by analysis of moon rocks which suggested that the tech that couldn't really originate from the moon. The composition wasn't close enough, right? So they, by default, the impact hypothesis became the preferred or, you know, the consensus theory, but not because it suddenly strengthened, but just its <laughs> opponents kind of lost by the fact that this material didn't match. So when you look closer, though, this, you know, now accepted theory, 
it's full of holes. I mean, for a start, you've got this problem that NASA did a load of experiments with this, right, with this tech type. And they, they found that these tech type buttons that they're called, now this is a particular shape of tech type that's only known from the Australite strewn field. So once in the whole 4.6 billion years of history, once do we get this material, once do we get it shaped in this way? They said that these tech type buttons can only have formed if a body is in orbit and explodes, then some of this debris enters the Earth's atmosphere at a shallow angle, basically like a decaying orbit, and slowly enters, so it has time for secondary heating. So you start off with these little spheres of glass, because liquid in space will take a spherical shape, then they froze, so you get these spherical glass balls. These have started to come in, and then the heating causes liquefaction on the front, and the liquid runs to the back, and you get this kind of nose cone shape. It's clearly shaped by aerodynamic forces, and that's why NASA recognized it's obviously was shaped by aerodynamic forces, because they've designed nose cones and all that. So these things come in like that, and then they've rained down across essentially all across southern Australia. It's the only place they're found in that form. The rest of the tectite stream field is in other forms, dumbbells, teardrop shapes, and other shapes. Now, the other problem you have here is that within some of these, you have bubbles, right? But these are bubbles of hard vacuum. So again, where do you get hard vacuum? You don't get it on Earth in an impact. You get that in space. And <laughs> another few things there is, there's something called a Moses Law. Moses Law is to do with the formations of glasses. And that, you know, when you try and make a homogeneous glass without bubbles in it, you have to kind of heat in a certain way over a certain period of time to make it homogeneous and get rid of the bubbles. And we do that when we're forming glasses. Now, Australite tectite is very homogeneous. You find that across all these different pieces, the composition is more or less the same. And you don't find partly melted material, you know, where if you have an impact, you can imagine around the edges, what you have is chunks where there's rock with part melt to tectite, right? So you'll find that. And also you'll find that where you hit granite, you'll have more granite in a piece, and when it's hit sandstone, you have more sandstone. So you can understand, isn't it? You know, if you have an object, if it's hitting into an area with mixed rock, you're going to have different composition in different pieces, and you're going to have some that are part rock, part glass. It's just that's how it is. Yeah, they fuse together somewhat. Yeah, because it's a singular energy event, momentary singular event, and so that's how it works. And you get a lot of bubbles in it as well. You get a lot of bubbles. Instead, with the australite, it's as though the energy heating is over some period of time. Which, God, this is the idea we're told that there's an energy weapon that's been heating this ship, melting it, and blows it up. Right? And that's exactly what we're seeing with this. So we have this homogenous glass. There's no signs of part melt or bits of rock in there. Nothing like that. And it's got vacuum bubbles. So we know it's happening in space. NASA are telling us the source body was in orbit. And there's a whole problem with that. What's it doing in orbit? Because a huge object like that shouldn't be able to be captured by Earth's gravity, because our planet is not massive enough, like Jupiter and Saturn, which can capture quite large objects, even temporarily capture comets. Earth can't. We sometimes capture things car-sized, right? So we have another problem. What's this even doing in orbit? Also, we have 80% silica. No asteroids or objects in space are known to have more than 60% silica that we've ever found. So we have this, now again, this more increasingly bizarre object that is matching precisely with the information that this object has transferred, right? <laughs> it starts to so get to that point, like, hang on, this is bizarre. And I'm thinking at the beginning of this, I wouldn't even find any sign of it. Instead, I find that there's this mystery that is only solved by it. Mm, I love it. Yes, this is, uh, you know, why I do this show, these kind of stories. And it seems like you found the remnants of the mothership, but who blew it up? How did it blow up the way it did? Well, then you get into bits that, yeah, I can certainly give you what's told, but I can't prove it. You know, so obviously the major focus in the book, obviously, is on, as you know, the three major events which I'm able to provide good evidence for. But we are told that, yeah, that there's already a group of advanced beings on this planet, what we might refer to now as crypto terrestrials. They essentially are not even necessarily what we could extraterrestrial, right? Because they supposedly have been here pretty much since you know, very early on in Earth's history, right? There's a group of beings here that are described as kind of reptilian humanoid in form now i'm sure most people out there that listen to your show or into any of these topics are familiar with the idea that there are people encountering reptilian looking beings or they've heard about them in conspiracy theory and all the rest of it well like it or not that's what we're told they're like and that there has been this agreement between them and this visiting group or a collective of beings from various places in in the universe that have arrived in a singular ship, that there's a kind of an alliance or a federation or whatever you want to call it, but this is not a ship just of one type of entities. 
but there's been an agreement between them that the earth is meant to be getting handed over to this alliance and apparently it once was sort of under their direction it was once ceded by them and that there has been this brokered agreement to hand over the planet there's a betrayal the ship is attacked is hit with what they describe as i think it's electromagnetic resonance weaponry which sort of entrains the ship and you know vibrates it and melts it and then it blows up and so that we have then another group on board and there's different beings some of these are described as a silica beings that have a kind of a frame like a robot frame that moves them around you know so they're not even all biological some of them don't even seem to be fully in our reality they're kind of interdimensional beings so it's a really complex scenario that we're told about which it sort of <laughs> shouldn't it be in a way you know I mean, sometimes we want things to be nice and easy, like in a movie, right? But this is far more complex than that. And so we don't have a nice, simple story. And that these beings that on Earth, there is consequences for them. Because we're told five years later, another group of extraterrestrials arrive who are part of this greater alliance, and that they are described as a leonine humanoid race of warriors that have a long, long history of war with these reptilians, and they come in and say, you know, you've destroyed a peaceful colony ship. Get off the planet. That was the agreement. If you don't get off the planet, we're going to bombard you. And they said most of them flee. They go through a Stargate to Orion. Apparently, it's where they come from. But they flee. And that there's some of them don't. And they begin a bombardment. And they say, but we don't use you know, lasers or anything like that. So we pull in asteroids from nearby. And we bombard the planet with those. And they clarify. They say, if we want to, we can crack a planet open. No problems. So you think of it on those scales, the kind of things that go on out there, if that's you accept this. That it's not just, you know, we're gonna pee pee shoot some razor some razor mm-hmm. laser down. No, no, they literally just pull in some asteroids, send them down. And so they do that and they bombard these areas where they're supposedly the underground bases of this other party and destroy most of those. Now obviously we sort of assumed that they are at the same time protecting the areas where the survivors from the first ship are now based. And that these survivors also have decided to remain, not to go with, they offered obviously to leave, but they've decided they're going to remain and they're going to modify a hominin species on the planet, which is obviously where a lot of the main thrust of the book goes. Hmm. Sorry, I should say, sorry, that again, with that asteroid bombardment, as I clarify, this was another thing I thought, well, you know, if this is real, couldn't we find some evidence of an asteroid bombardment, right? And again, this would be quite extraordinary because the last time we really had impacts from all sides all the time regularly was kind of the late heavy bombardment going back you know over 3.5 billion years ago when it was kind of chaos in the solar system so i'm thinking well if this was multi-directional bombardment surely we'd all know about that i mean this you know we all know about the dinosaurs getting whacked and you know we hear about other impact events surely it'd be big news there'd be like nat geo specials on you know the time the earth nearly died from multi-directional hits right so i'm thinking what well, is that real you know can that be real so I started digging into that, and it turned out that only in 2015 that it had been detected that there had been a multi-directional asteroid bombardment of our planet. And when did it happen to be? It turns out that it's dated to around 780,000 years ago, which is when the australite tektite is dated to, 780,000 years ago, right? Huh. So you're like, hang on, what is going on here? So you've, now you've got this bizarre object breaking up, and you've got the multi-directional asteroid bombardment. This thing they've hit in Central America, they hit down in Tasmania, they've hit... Some are up in Southeast Asia. And the other thing about this, you start thinking, okay, was this a singular object breaking up? Because I mean, that might be an easier explanation, right? But no, because when they did the analysis at different sites, they found the composition was different. So these are separate asteroids coming in. And that's exactly what we're told in this material, right? It's saying that you know, they called in different asteroids and just bombard us from all sides. And that's exactly what they found. Bear in mind, Valerie's book that she wrote about this, I'm using as a source, is published in 2003. So she can't be cherry picking this out and then making a sci-fi story because it just did not exist at the time. Nobody knew this had happened, right? So you've now got another massive hit and another anomalous event because there's no other point in time, you know, that we just don't see that stuff happening, right? We don't have objects every now and again in orbit blowing up. We don't every now and again have multi-directional asteroid bombing. These are unique, major anomalous events now coinciding in time, right? And matching with something that has purportedly come from an intelligence that says it's an extraterrestrial that knows our history and is now being proven accurate and accurate again, right? Right. And man, it is so epic. Warring alien races. I love it. It's a movie in itself. If I had a few million, I wouldn't be writing a book about it. I'll tell you that. I'm making a movie about it. <laughs> Indeed. 
And for the listeners' context, that you know, all this comes from this Alcaringa stone. Mm-hmm. Where is this stone today? I know the woman who has it or communicates with it does have a website. Seems to still be alive. I mean, are these stories still coming out of it? No, because it was as intended. It was given back to the the lady that brought it to her temporarily, and that it was then forwarded on back to the traditional custodians, which are, as I understand it, the Arente people around Uluru. So that I imagine they still have this. Now, would they come forward and share? Maybe they will. You know, if someone yeah. has contacts with elders of the Arente people, I want to look into that. I mean, I don't personally have those contacts, but I don't know if they would tell you. Again, you're dealing with what should be some of the most sacred artifacts of these people, right? So I don't yes. know whether, I mean, if someone has that kind of connection, then maybe they can track it down. I assume it is there. Oh, man. Yeah, you got to try. Got to try. But hey, I wanted to try to get a little bit more into the genetics of the DNA. <laughs> yeah. I know we're at the end of the road, but sure. you do a great job in the book of breaking this stuff down and dense DNA talk and sometimes get a bit too in the weeds for me. Mm-hmm. But are there a couple of points you'd want to make people understand when it comes to our genes and DNA and some of the weird stuff we got in there just to round out our overall show today? Sure. And I think, you know, that's the third point. So the third biggie in the book in terms of this narrative is that, you know, we are told that, you know, after having the ship destroyed, you know, the impact, which we now have them both dated, you know, soon as real events dated to 780,000 years ago. The third big one, of course, is the claim that the surviving extraterrestrials modify an existing hominin and they essentially make the first Homo sapiens. Now, in recent years, the mainstream has actually shifted their dates on this. They've now gone back to it being somewhere in the region of 550 to 750 or so thousand years ago. And if you look in other studies, they're suggesting 800,000, possibly before. But there's a coalescence there around this date of 780,000, which happened to already be known in the fossil record, because it was known that from around 800,000 years ago, the human cranium goes into a mad like acceleration. So we knew from before genetics, we knew that something weird happened around 800,000 years ago and that the human brain just goes into this off the scale kind of acceleration, structural changes, size changes. And now we have the genetics that is backing that up. You know, we also know now that Homo sapiens themselves are breaking off from some precursor species around that time. We have Neanderthals, Denisovans, you know, modern humans, all these large brained humans are splitting off from a common ancestor around about 780,000 years ago, right? So that, just to frame this a little bit, you know, we now have mainstream science catching up with what I've put in books already. Their dates have now slid to my dates. And that they're now seeing that actually all these different groups are splitting off from some strange happening around 780,000 years ago, which if you think about it, if you've got experimentation going on, is it a shock that it's going to produce more than one hominin lineage? No, nope. <laughs> right? Because it's experimentation, yeah? So you're ending up with different ones. In fact, you may intend to do that to see which one fares best. So you can make a few different lineages, right? So we have that happening. So how do we validate that? So if you go down, drill down into the genomics, what we find is one particularly compelling and important change is the fusing of chromosome 2. Now, I'm not the first person ever to suggest that the fusing of chromosome 2 is a marker for an alien intervention or a godlike intervention if you go to the creationists they also the creationist scientists say that chromosome 2 is you know the difference between humans and all of the primates and why we're not really primates and that we're god's creation so you'll find that in there but conversely you also find you know that people like lloyd pie and stuff in the past suggested that chromosome 2 was a signature of modification but he of course unfortunately he passed away before we got to the point now where we can drill down and get dating on this and stuff, right? We found out now that Neanderthals, Denisovans, and us, we all share this fusion of chromosome two. So other primates and other earlier humans had 48 chromosomes. We have 46. Now, what we find is an end-to-end fusion where there are deletions and additions at the fusion site. So it's not just straight fusion. It looks like someone has added and taken away bits. And it also fuses on an active gene, which is extraordinary. And that gene happens to be to do with reproduction, the immune system, the brain. There's a few different factors you have to understand with chromosome 2 fusion. First of all, that usually when chromosomes fuse, it's a problem. That's the first thing. Sometimes it can be neutral, but usually it's a problem, really negative. Now, in this case, it is posited by the academics that the only way that you could have this persist in the way that it has is if it conferred extraordinary benefits. Because you've got to remember that there is a total replacement. All 48 chromosome humans disappear. And that all we have is 46 chromosome humans. Now, you think it was a small group and there's a massive population of the others. How does that happen? 
Like the first thing they posit, well, it must have had extraordinary benefits. That meant that they had so much better survival abilities than everyone else that they could outcompete anybody. The second thing is that it would probably have had to have happened in a small, isolated population for it to become, first of all, genetically persistent in that population and not recessive. So you'd need to have a small group with those changes interbreeding. Isn't that starting to sound to you like some people in a lab, <laughs> right? So you've got this isolated small population where it's becoming persistent, where they're interbreeding. And then when they're released out, they have these extraordinary benefits above anyone else that they can do all sorts of things. But not only that, I think that we have here the signature of something else called what we would think of now as CRISPR gene drives, right? Now, I'm not going to say it's exactly the same, because I think we're talking about beings that are well ahead, but we are now just on the coattails of them, because we have these CRISPR gene drives where you can, not only can you modify the genome with CRISPR technologies, but with gene drive technologies, what you do is you modify in such a way is that when the two individuals, you know, the male and female mix, you know, have children, instead of getting 50% information from each parent, you know, like in a normal scenario, the modified parent's information overwrites the other one and you get a hundred percent from that parent so if you imagine now you've got these beings going out you know they've made in our image now they go forth and multiply like the biblical kind of stuff so you send them out and now no matter what other hominin they interbreed with the children will be these upgrades now that makes a lot of sense especially now that we know we're doing this with mosquito populations experimenting with funded by bill gates and darpa so no worries there right of course not and now these are extinction technologies as well because because you can also turn off the ability to have children and stuff like that. so if people want to be worried about something definitely worry about gene drives being funded by darpa and bill gates but we see the fingerprint for this in the past and then on top of this there are a number of interesting genes for example there are brain genes one that is described as having appeared fully formed out of non-coding dna and just gives us these amazing benefits in terms of the brain i think it's the folds in the brain or something and there's another one which is described as being a short segment of a longer gene that looks almost like it was cut out and xeroxed and put back in their words like xeroxed like this is what we're doing now and yet these people looking at the genome are finding those same kind of fingerprints of looking like pieces that like they were cut out replicated put back in and gave us the neocortex like the most advanced part of the brain the folds in the brain all of this stuff that is unique to modern humans and neanderthals you know that was unique to homo sapiens i include that denisovans and neanderthals they're all homo sapiens right in fact i don't know if you saw the recent article came out and said that neanderthals and modern humans were less different than grizzly bears and polar bears which often have children together hmm. right <laughs> right, we were less different. Is that sounding like a separate species to you? Right, <laughs> that we regularly could have children. The children were viable. There was no problem. Right, so we have all these large-brained Homo sapiens that are all coming out of this event, and they have these extraordinary gene changes, chromosome fusions, and most importantly, and I'll just quickly squeeze this in because these HARs or human accelerated regions, of which we now have hundreds, and these are regions where evolution seems to have been massively sped up somehow by not any understood means yet understood, and that these are areas in the non-coding DNA, and they're also in areas that are called highly conserved. Now, this is really important because I explained in the book that if you look at people that talk about you know, the idea of maybe aliens leaving a message for us in DNA, which mainstream people do sometimes speculate on, they said the problem with that is that you know, evolution removes that because mutations occur, changes, you know, good or bad, will erase those messages. unless the changes are made in non-coding DNA in highly conserved areas because those almost never change. A message there or change there can persist to be found millions of years later. Now, funnily enough, we've just started finding hundreds of these. And I'll give you one, just one good example, HAR1, the first one that was detected. Now, there is a snippet of code, 118 DNA letters long, and they contrasted it between chickens, chimpanzees, and human beings. Now, what they found was that between the chicken and the chimpanzee, there were two letters that had changed over 300 million years of evolution. That is some stable code, right? Yeah. Now, they then compared the chimpanzee to the human that's supposed to have only been set for 5 million, 6 million years, nowhere near that 300 million, right? And they said there should be no difference. And what they found was 18 letters had changed. So mm. you have to sync that in. I mean, and they ran this through the software and it came up with a statistical chance of zero for this having happened by any understood evolutionary mechanisms. Zero. <laughs> right? 
So wow. what the hell is going on here? And now they found hundreds of them. And of course, if we're talking about random mutations, random to me, I imagine to you, would be changes all throughout the system, right? So you've got changes of you know elements to do with the kidney or the skin, the hair, you know, random, right? Would you say that over 50% of these being to do with the brain sounds like random to you? <laughs> no. Doesn't sound very random to me. <laughs> right. So it turns out that's what it is. They found over 50% to do with fetal development of the brain and also to do with these like the opposable thumbs and stuff like that, that we've got. The things that differentiate us. In fact, a few of the articles say, are these HRRs what make us different from all other primates? Are these the fundamentals? Which is the same thing has been said about chromosome 2. So chromosome 2 and HARs are now considered to be basically the fundamental changes that made us different to all the other primates. Damn. And it turns out that they're anomalous. <laughs> you nailed it, man. I'm really glad you brought up the fusion of chromosome 2. That's something I've always been interested in, but haven't really been able to make a ton of sense of. And the kind of stuff you ended with there is a great part of the book where you talk about how weird it is evolutionarily that our kids are born so half-baked. You know, it kind mm -hmm. of takes a while for the human to, to form and it's reliant on the mother for so long, as opposed to other animals that are like, you know, day two, they're walking, they're moving around. Uh, we're just so different. So very yeah, interesting. We're, and We're born as a fetus, basically. We are born still as a fetus who has to continue developing outside the womb. Otherwise, our brain, would be, you know, our head would be too big to be born. I should add as well, sorry, I've always missed the point there that with chromosome two, the dating on that as well has been done by, there's a British biologist. He pointed out the first of all, obviously, if it happened before the split with Neanderthals, Denisovans and us, that means it has to have happened at least back towards that 750 to 800,000 years ago when they split. But then he wanted to see whether it, whether it went back further. And so he did a deep sort of chemical analysis and concluded it had to have happened somewhere around 750,000 years ago. So again, the yeah. dating has been done now on chromosome 2, and it falls back onto that same moment when the Neanderthals, Denisovans are split. So it's fundamentally there at around that, <laughs> again, around that 780,000 years ago. So Validated now again. got... Yep, so you got it again. So you get the craft blowing up, you get the bombardment and the genetic changes with the brain all occurring at 780,000 years ago. And just to throw in another one for people, it just so happens that 780,000 years ago was the last time we had a full magnetic reversal on this planet. So it's like chicka ching ching for mega weird, anomalous, massive events, catastrophic and earth changing events all colliding at 780,000 years ago. And yet this is a period that I've not seen any Nat Geo special about. So what the hell is going on here that there seems to be some kind of deliberate ignorance or ignoring of this point in time where we have extraordinary things happening. So why is this not mainstream? You know, even if you take away the aliens and anything I've said, you know, subtract me, uh, talking artifacts, reptilians, subtract all that and just ask, why is there no Nat Geo special saying, you know, 780,000 years ago, you know, the time when massive asteroids were bombarding Earth and humans were undergoing brain changes and weird things were orbiting and exploding in space and what the hell is going on why are we not being told that why are we not here why am i having to find that out from some alien you know a book about an alien art <laughs> why does it take that for me to hear about these things this is insane yes it is a good question but of course the answer is that nat geo is owned and controlled by the reptilian crypto terrestrials <laughs> but man you know dial in your time machines people because we know exactly where we need to go now this 780,000 years ago, this is it. But man, wow, my mind is thoroughly blown. I feel like we fit four hours of content into a two-hour show. Luckily, we own the airwaves and can start and stop whenever we want, but I just can't take up people's entire days. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, it was really great to get back to an interview like this, given all the events of 2020. I feel like I got that old THC energy back. So thanks for Really bring in the heat. You are a great dance partner. Thank you. And b before I cut you loose, give them the rundown of how to get more Bruce Fenton in their lives. Absolutely. I mean, there is, if they want to interact with me, there's a sanity warning on that, of course. But you, <laughs> you can interact with me directly on Twitter. I'm at Exogenesis HH, is my handle. I'm fairly interactive, probably spend too much time there. I'm also on Facebook. Don't use it a lot, but you can certainly contact me via, you know, Facebook. I have a few websites, ancientnews.net, which is archaeological mostly, hybridhumans.net. There's a few articles about you know, extraterrestrial stuff on there. Um, BruceFenton.info, my homepage, and DaniellaFenton.com, which is my wife's kind of professional profile for her shamanic and psychical work. 
all four of those. And the book can be found, the Exchange book can be found, you know, wherever books are sold, obviously on Amazon and Borders and all this stuff. But you should be able to in your shop. You know, if you go in the shop and ask them, you know, can they order it for you or you tell them, put it on the shelves, which would be nice. You know, it's out there already, so in the US. I think the print version is not in Europe yet, but the audio and Kindle are. So, you know, it's basically kind of everywhere. Eric Von Daniken did the forward, which was very kind of him. I'm saying it should be in schools. I don't think the paradigm is quite at where well, schools will stock yet. But, <laughs> but yeah, you know, hopefully people will check it out. And I will just add as well that because I know people love free stuff. And they say, you know, why well, you write books? They cost money. Everything should be free. But I mean, I, that does mean it costs me starving to death in a garbage bin somewhere. But still, I do give out free content. So there's a movie, 780,000, Our Alien Origin Story, which they'll find on YouTube, which is totally free to view. And that was in partnership with Alex Skeptico. So if anyone wants to check that out, that is available now to see and overviews a lot of what we've been talking about, but with documents, you know, with shown on screen and stuff so they can have a look at that. Excellent. Yes, I look forward to seeing that. Alex is a good friend of ours. He does good stuff and I can't wait to dive in. But man, really awesome work, fun and provocative. And you make a great case for some really epic stuff. It's very much appreciated. We'll have to do this again sometime. But until then, take care, man. Thank you very much, Greg. Take care. Wow. Bruce Fenton, bring in the heat. Now I'm in a good mood. That was a lot of fun. I like seeing somebody make a compelling case for something as far out as an alien mothership exploding in the air over the earth. I love this sort of history. And again, just like so many shows, the second hour really jumped off when I asked Bruce if he thinks there's any chance today's elite are part of a Draco lineage or agents of Draco overlords. And could a lot of their biotechnocratic ideas come out of a desire to track some sort of DNA marker? <laughs> well, from there, it was off to the races. I did not know he was going to be as down with that sort of idea to the degree that he was. And I think he crushed his THC appearance about as well as he could. And he talks fast, so I feel like we did fit four hours into a two-hour show. I mean, telepathic artifacts, conscious communication from cosmic containers of knowledge. This is pretty unique stuff. And so much of this kind of material that we hear does come back to the same sort of shape of an alien race running from another alien race in the ancient past, hiding out on Earth, seeding their DNA, creating humans. Echoes of this sort of story are always coming around from one channeler or contactee or another. If you fold that sort of context into the angels mating with human women thing, it's all very similar stuff. So... You know, let's make it canon already. <laughs> That's what I say. I also agree with Bruce when he says it's not an evidence problem. It's a people problem. It's an unwillingness to access new information or any information from outside official channels. Obviously, that's a big problem in many ways right now. People are just losing their minds out there. I hope everything's going all right for you listeners. I'm probably going to get repetitive when I say that we've got to be presenting ourselves as good examples of independent alternative thinkers. We're getting a lot of bad PR right now. And as much as I do like to watch a good public meltdown, I don't think throwing everything out of your cart and screaming at the Walmart greeter about the pandemic as you storm off is a very effective strategy to fight back against all this. Just like how I imagine you wouldn't change that many minds if you started dropping 9-11 truths in the line for airport security. I'm not even saying you're wrong, but we're up against the most effective and highly refined propaganda machine this round of human history has known. And I don't even know if we can win, but I doubt that's how it happens if we do. I tend to think that calmness and stability plus time is what does it. It's what gets people to change their minds. Lies can't last forever, and that's as true for history as it is for anything. And I do have faith that when the capstone cabal plays a big hand, like a once-in-a-decade hand or a once-a-century hand for that matter, it takes time, but the number of people who lose their trust in the empire and all of its institutions will grow. 
The amount of people who see it for what it is, or at least consider the whole system incompetent and its experts incompetent, will increase. And we should make those people feel welcome in this new reality and not alone. And let them know that we don't trust the president either, despite the picture painted by pretty much all media. But in higher side news, the last of the traditional joint session videos is up on the plus member bonus content page. We will still have a monthly joint session. Maybe it needs a new name now, but it still sort of applies because it's a solo podcast episode that I'll do every month for plus members based on the material posted in the joint session forum thread. So it's still a combined effort. That's where the joint comes in. But there's also a Q&A thread if you have a question for me. And then there is a separate joint session thread for your own theories and wild experiences and anything else you might want to relay to the Plus members at large. Content for me to talk about. I've been told by a lot of people they have interesting things to share, but they either can't make the live stream because of work or something, or they're too nervous to talk on the fly. Or they couldn't get called on because I let six people take up three hours. That does happen, and I'm sorry. It is just the nature of taking calls. I don't want to be rude. I'm the host. So this way, with this new format, I think we get more people involved, and it will be easier to digest if it's already in your podcast feed, and I'm reading and editing the whole thing down like normal. So that's what we're doing. There it is. So go on in and fill that forum up with stuff for me. Remember, even if you were just a Plus member for a month or two years ago, your forum login still works. It is forever. So if you ever gave me just eight bucks, you can still get in there and participate in those threads. I'm also going to probably read some of the harshest feedback that I get in these joint session podcast shows. Just because there's something funny about a person reading the nasty things people say about them firsthand, we can make comedy out of the venom. And that's alchemy, right? But that is the show. Big thanks to Bruce. He is the man. Of course, the first hour had a lot of great stuff. I wanted to make sure that we got through Bruce's complete case for this 780,000-year-old event. And then in the Plus show, like I mentioned, it got pretty classic THC and pretty conspiratorial, but we talked about stuff like indigenous knowledge, alien engineered retroviruses, the alien octopi, cosmic radiation and genetic mutation, biophotons, light, DNA, and the elite, reptilians, crypto-terrestrials, dracoist elite sacrifice, bloodline tracing agendas of the elite. And all kinds of uh, really interesting stuff. Maybe better for the inner circle. So sign up for Plus if you want to hear my full interviews. Or just listen to the first hour ad-free. And tell your friends. If you would be so bold. Either way, it's all good. But that said, I'm getting out of here. If by chance you do live in San Diego. And you happen to hear this episode in the first few hours it's released. And you're free tonight. Our good friend Sam Tripoli will be performing at the American Comedy Company outside. That's cool. And in fact, to get around Governor Newsom's weird rules around which businesses can and can't operate, it's important to say that the American Comedy Company in San Diego is not doing live comedy shows. That would be irresponsible. They're hosting live comedic protests. (laughs) Loopholes, right? But hey, Sam has a 7 and a 9 o'clock show. I'll probably be hanging around in between them or after. So come say hey. If you're one of those like 10 people or so listening that will meet those previously mentioned prerequisites. But big thanks to Bruce again. I had a lot of fun. Thanks to you guys for listening. He also has that new documentary that summarizes this work as well with visuals put out now on Alex's Skeptico channel. Do check that out if you like a little more. And I'll see you next time. Your move, ancient alien overlords, DNA seeders, and cosmic Draco cult followers. Your fucking move.